After all this travel, then in 1924, Rebecca settled back down in London, and um, she didn't have contact with her father because he had sort of ostracized her and, uh, th when he threw her out of the house, but she did have contact with her other family members. And this is a piano trio called the English Ensemble that she performed with um, for you know, throughout the, the later 20s and the 1930s. And so Mae Mukley on the left, Rebecca Marjorie Hayward, the violinist, and um, Kathleen Long, the pianist. And um, in fact, Marjorie Hayward and Mae Mukley performed in the formal premiere of the piano trio in London in 1922, along with Myra Hess. And so that was a very um, you know, wonderful ensemble to have premiering that work. Um, and it had been given an informal performance in New York, in New York City, but not a, f uh, a public one. So, and the piano trio, she had a lot of difficulties getting it published, which I think, you know, the viola sonata was published, it was composed in, she, you know, premiered in 1919 and then published by 1921. The piano trio, although she wrote it in 1921, um, she had difficulties getting a publisher to accept it. And then um, it wasn't published until 1928. Um, I believe it was Boozing Hawks then. But she talks about going to um, going to publishers, and there's one description where she talks about um, she went and talked to um, so and so the publisher, and they were very charming and very sweet and very oily and committed to nothing at all. Um, so that kind of difficulty, and it was really a time when um, women had these difficulties getting publishers, and I think I'll talk a little bit about more before I go on with the rest of the slides, of uh, just sort of some of the obstacles that women faced and the attitude toward women composers in general. Um, this difficulty she had publishing the trio, both even though we don't know that was because of being, a, you know, overtly because of being a woman, people did face this kind of difficulties, and Ethel Smythe and Ruth Crawford both were told blank, just point blank by composers, we're not going to publish your, your music because women have a hard time. Women's music doesn't sell, we're, we, we're, we don't believe it's going to be, no one's going to be interested in it. Um, and you know, Ethel Smythe and, and Ruth Crawford are such different composers, you know, one is very Victorian era and one is very modern, and, but both getting that same line from, from publishers. Um, and there's a review of a piece that Rebecca had published a piece for um, vo violin and piano called Midsummer Moon. And the review of the publication, I think, gives you a sense of some of the, the gendered attitude that um, people, that was very common and that women faced as obstacles. So this is a review of a publication um, of her music, of her piece Midsummer Moon, and published in 1926 in the Musical Times. In reading Miss Rebecca Clark's Midsummer Moon, our first impression is one of relief and gratitude, for the new woman composer is at least free from the cloying sentimentality of the old. May nights and moonlight, moonlight are no longer the source of gushing platitudes. The modern woman looks upon these things with the detachment of a scientist. A scientist, she has an eye for the picturesque, but it is an eye undimmed by a rising tear. So this real, um, you know, this conflict between the old, the, the emotionality, the sentimentality, and the new woman is, you know, cold, detached scientist, but, you know, it's, it's still not um, really what one would see as being, you know, a great composer. So she's, you know, it's, it's really sort of the double bind. You're one extreme or the other, and women are not really going to be in the mainstream of what a composer is from this kind of gendered attitude of the time. So she performed, and I think her career, uh, that picture of her with the English ensemble, she felt very comfortable as a performer. And I think having this community of women musicians that she worked with, and she never had the community as a composer. Um, you know, she really worked a lot in isolation. And, and also women were not um, allowed to study at the universities at that time, even though she was able to study music at the Royal College of Music. But um, a lot of the camaraderie that um, Von Williams writes about this, a lot of the camaraderie that men had was from the contacts that they made at the universities. And so she had these performing colleagues um, and her piano quartet. And I think that was her real support network. And that was why I think she winds up being sort of more comfortable in her role as a violist rather than her role as a composer. And so 
by the 1930s, um, she's really writing very, very little. It, there's things sort of dwindle down in the 20s. She's writing songs. She's writing small pieces. Um, and then she writes, she composes um, some songs, but there's hardly anything survives from the 30s. And then she has another little, when World War II breaks out, she um, happens to be visiting her brothers in the United States. And is she's described it as being stranded with them and stuck in the United States away from her, um, away from her composing career and all her friends in London. And so she's stuck in the United States during World War II, and she has another spurt of composing at that time. And there's about 10 pieces, including um, a, a wonderful piece for viol and clarinet that's very neoclassical in style. So, um, and then she gets married. So this is a, a, a nice little, you know, kind of a caricature of uh, her playing the viola. And she really played with very distinguished performers, with Pablo Casals, with Sirkin with Heifetz. Um, yeah, she had, uh, she was really well known as a chamber music performer. And she did some solo playing too, although she always described it as being more of a chamber music career. Um, and that, that's her in the 40s. Um, she gets married in 1944. She starts seeing in New York a James Friskin, who had been a friend of hers at the Royal College of Music, you know, way back when um, they were young and in their early 20s at the Royal College. And so they start seeing each other and then they get married. She gets married in 1944 and after that she really is very identified as Mrs. James Friskin. And he was a piano teacher at the Juilliard School of Music for over 50 years. And so he had all kinds of students and they knew her as Mrs. Friskin and eventually there were, she wasn't known at all as a composer. Um, and people were, surprised to start discovering that she had composed. And it all came about very accidentally, as she describes it. Um, in 1976, around the time of her 90th birthday. But she was rediscovered after being um, nearly forgotten because this, um, mu this journalist and reporter had a radio show, Robert Sherman. He actually wanted to do a show about, he was doing a show about Myra Hess, the famous pianist and he knew that she had known Myra Hess as a child. And so he um, went to interview her about Myra Hess. And in the interview, you can sort of hear this discovery where she mentions her own music and how Myra Hess had played her own music. And then he realized, well, you're a composer. Maybe I should find out about that. So he did a broadcast about Rebecca Clark and celebrated her 90th birthday in 1976. And so that's really what got the ball rolling in getting her rediscovered and doing these interviews. And I want to um, play a little clip from the interview that he did with her in 1976. And, um, and he talked to her about all kinds of things, um, you know, about the story about Anthony Trent, about you know, her performing career, her composing career. And then they also performed some of her music, um, the piano trio, the viola sonata, some songs. But in this interview, he asks her, um, he asks her, why did you stop composing? And so you won't hear the question, but you'll, you'll hear her response. <laughs> 